Good morning, everyone. I'm Council Member Robert Cornegy, Chair of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. We're here today to hold a hearing on three bills that affect New Yorkers in a variety of ways. These, <clears throat> these include Intro 1545, which will restrict alcohol advertisements near schools, Intro Number 790, which would prohibit multiple for rent signs on a property, and Intro 1710, which would extend the city's J51 tax incentive program until 2020. Today we'll hear from the Department of Buildings, the Department of Housing, Preservation and Development, and Department of Finance, as well as from members of the real estate industry, health advocates, and other interested members of the public about these bills. Intro number 1545, sponsored by Council Member Andy King, and co-sponsored by myself, bars certain signs that advertise alcoholic beverages within a certain radius of K-12 schools. Underage drinking is an issue across the nation and in New York City. Youth who drink alcohol are more likely to suffer health and other potentially long-term consequences. Increased exposure to alcohol advertising has been shown to result in more favorable attitudes towards alcohol and to a greater likelihood of drinking alcohol, especially among young people. In addition, these type of advertisements tend to target students and neighborhoods of color. Through this legislation, we hope to limit youth exposure to alcohol advertising near schools and decrease underage drinking. Intro 790, sponsored by Councilmember Van Bremer, seeks to limit excessive for rent signage. Excessive for rent signage can create eyesores, exacerbate vacancy concerns, and in some instances cause pedestrian obstructions. Finally, Intro 1710, sponsored by Councilmember Richards, extends the J51 tax abatement and exemption program until June 30th, 2020. This program is an important tool in preserving affordable housing in New York while incentivizing the repair and maintenance of existing housing. Through the J51 program, property owners receive a tax exemption or abatement for rehabilitation or conversion of multifamily housing. While the, while the property is in the program, existing real estate taxes are reduced or eliminated. Tenants of these buildings receive rent-stabilized leases while the J51 benefits are in force. I'd like to thank my fellow committee members who are here today. And we'll hear from the sponsors of the sponsor of proposed intro 1545, Council Member King first. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate your time and effort and energy to tackle this, this issue that we're having in the city of New York with our young people. I know as a former professional athlete, um, alcohol was not part of the equation. It was water and Gatorade. Um, as a former basketball player myself, the chair of juvenile justice and a youth developer today, I do understand certain messaging when children are developing can be critical to their success or their demise. And I think alcohol is one of those things that should be forbidden around any schools. That's why after seeing a big massive sign being advertised with a basketball and Jack Daniels in front of a high school, a middle school, and an elementary school. I say, how dare those in the business world think this is okay messaging for our children. So I'm thanking everyone today. I'm asking my colleagues to sign on to this because alcohol we know kills. We know guns kills. We know smoking kills. You know, all kind of bad activities kills. But alcohol is one of the number one diseases that hurt families each and every day. So I thank you again for partnering up and listening to everyone's conversation. I'm hoping the administration is on board because this is one of the best ways that we can save our children's life during their early stages of education. Thank you. Thank you. We'd like to now hear from um, uh, Councilmember Donovan R Richards from the Great Borough of Queens. The best borough of Queens. <laughs> See, you always got to go too far, <laughs> man. <laughs> <laughs> well, good morning. Thank you, Chair Carnegie, for holding this important t hearing. Uh, today we are hearing my bill intro 1710, which would extend the J51 tax abatement and exemption program into June 30th of 2020. More than ever in time, as we witness the affordability crisis and substandard living conditions tenants endure, it is critical that programs such as J51 are reaching the right pockets of the city. Tenant protections and enforcement is critical to ensuring that this tax abatement isn't being utilized to circumvent taxes at the expense of tenants in desperate need of repairs in their residential dwellings. It is my hope that as we look to extend J51 that we strengthen and seek to close any loopholes so that we can accomplish the mission this abatement seeks to address. That is simply to ensure tenants can live with dignity and respect they rightfully deserve. Once again, Mr. Chairman, thank you, and I look forward to hearing from the administration. Thank you, Council Member Richards. Um, I'd like to remind everyone who'd like to testify today to please, please fill out a card with the sergeant. We'll be sticking to a two-minute clock for all public testimony, and now we'll administer the oath of we will administer the oath.
to the administration before their testimony. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. Yes. You can begin your testimony at any time. Good morning, Chair Cornegy and members of the Housing Committee of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. My name is Patricia Zafiriadis, and I am the Associate Commissioner of Housing Incentives with the City, New York City Department of Housing, Preservation, and Development, also known as HPD. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on Introduction 1710, sponsored by Council Member Richards. This bill would extend the J-51 benefit program that is available for the rehabilitation and upgrade of New York City's housing stock. The J-51 program has played a significant role in the improvement of New York's housing stock since the program's inception during the 1950s. The New York State J-51 tax benefit program is a property tax abatement and or an exemption given to residential apartment buildings for certain alterations or improvements. Boiler or window replacements are common types of eligible work. After doing the rehabilitation work, owners are eligible for a J-51 tax abatement and, in certain cases, a J-51 tax exemption as well. The abatement is an actual reduction in the amount of tax an owner pays and is related to the cost of work. The exemption ensures that the owner doesn't have to pay taxes on the increase in value resulting from the rehab work. All J-51 recipients receive abatements but exemptions are only issued in cases where the Department of Finance determines that the J-51 eligible renovation will lead to an increase in assessed value. The extension of the J-51 program is an important piece in the City's interest in providing safe, habitable, and affordable housing to residents of New York City, and the Administration supports the Council's reauthorization of this tax benefit program. Thank you again for the invitation to testify on this bill. I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Commissioner, I just want to thank you for the brevity in your testimony. You are this very morning. welcome. It is very, very refreshing for a Monday morning. Thank you. My pleasure. Good morning. Unfortunately, I won't be as brief, but I'll try to read faster. Good morning, Chair Carnegie and members of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. I am Melanie LaRocca, the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Buildings. I'm joined today by Gus Sarakis, my first Deputy Commissioner, and together we're pleased to be here to offer testimony on two of the bills before the committee today regarding signage. Signs, including accessory signs and advertising signs, must comply with requirements in both the New York City Building Code and the New York City Zoning Resolution. The regulations in the Building Code address permitting and structural issues, and the regulations in the Zoning Resolution address issues including permissible surface area, projection, and height. Collectively, these regulations exist to protect the public from dangerous or legally installed signs and to reduce visual clutter. As such, the Department takes seriously its obligation to enforce these laws. That being said, Local Law 28 of 2019 instituted a moratorium which will run until February 2021 on the issuance of violations for accessory signs, which are also referred to as business, business signs. The Department recognizes that educating the business community regarding applicable laws and regulations is critical and is conducting outreach to small business owners so that they know exactly what they need to do to bring their signs into compliance. This outreach includes direct mailings to businesses who have received violations from the Department for illegally installed signs and direct out outreach to these businesses by our community engagement staff. We will also encourage Excuse me, we also encourage small businesses to visit our borough offices on Tuesday nights during our open house where they can receive one-on-one -on -one advice from department experts on signage issues or any construction projects they are planning. We thank this committee for its partnership on behalf of the small business community and look forward to updating this committee further on the implementation of this law. The first bill before the committee, intro 17, uh, excuse me, intro 790, would prohibit the placement of more than one ground or wall sign advertising the availability of retail or commercial space for rent on each side of a vacant commercial or mixed-use building. We would like to discuss this bill further with this committee and with its sponsor to better understand the issue it's seeking to resolve and to craft a careful, sol carefully, so a careful solution to such issue. Our concern 
is that the, this bill could have unintended consequences of resulting in additional enforcement actions being taken by the department against businesses and residential buildings seeking to rent their vacant space and reactivating that segment of the streetscape. Additionally, we're concerned about making it more difficult to operate a business in New York City by adding another layer of regulation. Finally, this committee should be aware that depending on the content of these signs, the department may be unable to take enforcement action until, local, until the Local Law 28 moratorium on the issuance of violations that I previously mentioned has been concluded. The next bill before the committee, intro 1545, would prohibit advertise, alcoholic ad advertisements on an outdoor sign with, within 500 feet of any direction of a school. Research suggests that greater exposure to alcohol advertisement can increase the likelihood of underage alcohol consumption and encourage heavier alcohol consumption. For these reasons, the administration banned alcohol advertising on city property earlier this year, and we are fully supportive of this bill as it reaffirms the administration's position on alcohol advertising. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Commissioner LaRocca, although you said your testimony was a little was longer, it still pales in comparison to some testimonies we've been we've heard that are six and seven pages. So I thank you as well. For thank the, you. For the, <laughs> and you are very well <laughs> for your brevity as well. Um, as a true testament to me, me being apologetic uh, about taking up so much time and being late, I am going to forego my round of questions and allow my colleagues to ask questions first because they've been here for quite some time. So. We're going to begin with council member. Hmm? Council member Cabrera. Uh, I, I just have one question, and, and maybe uh, this could have been uh, also directed to the sponsor of the bill. But when you look at intro 790, and thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, for allowing us to go first. Uh, that's. I also made a comment about your very youthful looking haircut. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> me too much. Uh, but in, in regard to intro 790, uh, would, I'm just curious when it comes to LED uh, signs, would that be, would you see that as applicable to, because in an LED sign, you will have multiple you know, like advertisement taking place every so many seconds. Uh, how L would you understand? Sure. So L uh, LED or illuminated signs right. are, in fact, considered signs. So that would be an area of enforcement the department could do. S but if this bill were to pass, right, and I I'm a business owner and I want to have, you know, I want to have three different advertisements taking place, you know, I don't want to mention any. Uh, specific companies, but company A, company B, then advertising company three, a product, and so forth. Would this bill obligate the business owner just to advertise just one product? So 740 would, is specific, as written, is specific to the uh, placement of signs advertising the availability of retail or commercial space within a vacant uh, commercial uh, or mixed-use property. So in the example you're giving, that would uh, constitute a sign if it were advertising a good or service that was not available at that location. That would be considered signage. That would be covered under current rules. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you so much. No I appreciate uh, your answer. Councilmember King. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. I appreciate the level of support um, for our legislation um, gives me hope um, that we can get this actually passed and done because it seems like we're on the same track with the city as well with other adver advertisement on city properties. My question would be to you with this. Um, I'm not even sure that this goes farther enough as um, far as the 500 square feet, um, whether it's from the property line or from the door. But I will look to, to figure out um, with the committee and how do we make sense of it, whether it starts from the door of the school. For me, I would say property lines for the school. Um, one of the things I have a big question, and I, I'll ask you for the record, um, I know as far as the legislation I was written, it says those businesses, excludes those businesses who have their license through the New York State Liquor Authority. 
My concern with that as well, even if a bodega can advertise the Corona sign, if I come outside of high school and the bodega's right across the street from high school, it's the same advertisement, so it kind of defeats the bill um, of the purpose of trying to help that point of advertisement cease to exist. What would be your response in figuring out how do we manage that? So twofold, uh, with respect to the distance, so you're correct to point out the legislation is silent to the way in which 500 feet from the uh, uh, advertisement should be calculated. And we would look forward to working with the committee in order to ensuring that the legislation is clear, because our goal is to ensure that we are effectively and uniformly applying the same standards across the city. Uh, for the second point, uh, I, I would say this. You're correct. Again, the law does uh, create an exemption for um, establishments that are licensed by the state for either the sale or uh, manufacturing of uh, alcoholic beverages. This department stands ready to enforce this law should it move forward, and we stand ready to play our role in ensuring the safety and well-being of children. And so I would leave that conversation respectfully to the committee, um, but know that we're ready to, uh, to move forward with the enforcement. Thank you. Thank you for those answers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Council Member Richards. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, just a few questions. Um, so uh, I wanted to hear a little bit more about uh, how many buildings received J-51 benefits between uh, 2018 and 2019. Sure. Thank you for that question. According to the most recent DOF tax expenditure report from fiscal year 2019, which is calculated in units, over 103,000 units citywide receive a J-51 tax exemption, and over 359,000 units citywide receive a J-51 tax abatement. I want to note that these numbers are from a snapshot in time, so they may include both new buildings in the program and those that entered the program over a decade ago, but are still receiving J-51 benefits. And can you just break down, how do you track and how could tenants track if their buildings are taking advantage of J-51? Sorry, just to understand the question, how will tenants What is know? the process for informing tenants? Sure. Um, so J-51 is, uh, is a tool that's out there to give relief to homeowners looking to do work on their buildings and improve conditions. And it also, in rental buildings, provides tenants with greater protections. To apply for J-51, uh, that process occurs after the completion of work. And what we do, uh, once we verify the work has been done, is we also make sure that the units are registered with the state as rent stabilized. So rent DHCR, stabilization, correct. Yes, correct, mm -hmm. DHCR. Rent stabilization is one of the strongest tools for tenant protections that are out there. Um, and we take compliance very seriously. So we make sure that the units are registered and uh, only then are benefits given to the building. And then the state will manage the reg annual registration thereafter. And are tenants informed is, I guess, the question I'm asking. That well, as part of the process, um, tenants would execute a lease that's rent stabilized. But uh, again, tenant you know, rent stabilization is one of the strongest protections that are out there. And it's overseen by the state, not by HPD. And so it's the city. And I would assume you would have some interest in ensuring that those units stay rent stabilized. So we absolutely does, so um, take compliance with the program very seriously. Um, we have this administration has inserted some of the most aggressive compliance tactics um, out there for tax incentives programs. We've taken unprecedented, step, unprecedented steps to ensure buildings follow all tax benefit and abatement requirements, working at the front of the process and monitoring the buildings throughout. We are absolutely invested in, in right. And what are the ramifications if someone takes advantage of this and perhaps tries to um, get rid of rent-stabilized apartments? And have you found any cases of that happening? And what, what are the ramifications? Sure. Give me one moment. Um, OK. So as I've mentioned, compliance and enforcement is a top priority for us. We have a unit uh, at HPD that's focused on this function. They are ready at any time to handle any referrals of noncompliance. 
um, what they would essentially do after a building is given the opportunity to cure is initiate revocation proceedings. And we're actually in process right now of revoking the benefit on a property. Right. And how many have been found to be in non-compliance? Do you have those numbers? Uh, for the J-51 program, yeah. I don't have those numbers there. But as I mentioned, we have a unit that was created within the past two years that is focused on this function for all of our tax incentives programs. Um, and they've done a, a lot of work in, ensure, in operationalizing normal compliance proceedings, and they are at the ready to take any referrals of non-compliance. And just go through what are some of the improvements that uh, a landlord could take advantage of when they do, uh, when they uh, take advantage of J-51. What kind of work? Yes. Sure. Give me one moment. Um, So J-51 covers a variety of work from major capital improvements to moderate rehabilitations um, to uh, limited conversions only with substantial government assistance. Um, the, by far the most common scenarios we see are major capital improvements and that includes the type of work that would fall under um, what you would expect, boiler, burner, windows, roof, waterproofing, point, electrical, rewiring, elevators that sort of thing. So J-51 is really an important tool in ensuring housing quality is maintained throughout the city while also ensuring tenant protections are put in place for renters. And how does HPD once again ensure that these things are happening? Do you come and inspect or is it self-certification? How sure. do you, how? Sure, how we have we... Um, a variety of ways. Let me just take you through the application process a little bit. Okay. So, Applications are filed after um, work is done. Um, there are a variety of different things that we do, but if, for example, the work exceeds $10,000, we will do an in place, um, a, an inspection of the work to make sure the work was done. But as normal course of business for every, any project, we also review uh, CPA certifications of the work and complete the application. And as I mentioned, we ensure that the units are registered and rent stabilized before we uh, enact the benefits. And take me through, where has this tax abatement been utilized the most? Can you speak of the sure. geography of? Sure, I can definitely do that. Um, let's see, according to the DOF tax expenditure report in fiscal year 19, we saw 27% of the abatements in Brooklyn and in Queens, 26% of the abatements in the Bronx, and 19% of the abatements in Manhattan, with 1% in Staten Island. For exemptions, it was a little bit different. We saw 22% of exemptions in Manhattan, 48% in the Bronx, 20% in Brooklyn, and 8% in Queens, and 1% in Staten Island. Um, so there's a mix throughout the city, but I will say that geographic use generally tracks with the type of housing stock that is more prevalent in these boroughs. So where you see more multi-family buildings, larger buildings, you will see more exemptions and abatements. Um, the exception that I will note is that there are certain properties in Manhattan, south of 110th Street, that are ineligible for the program. And New York City is a big place, so when you read off the boroughs, that's great. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm interested in you digging a little deeper, and I guess that today I'm not expecting you to go through every community in New right. York City, right. um, but we want to ensure that obviously this incentive is being utilized in places, especially where the housing stock uh, is in most need of rehabs, right? So how do you ensure that that is happening? Yeah, I, I mean, I think our goals are the same, council member. We think it's a really important tool to ensure housing quality throughout the city. I don't have the data on a more granular level available to me, but I'd be glad to continue I would love to see that before we proceed. Um, and um, I think I'm, and, and just go through your outreach strategy. How do building owners find out that this, uh, that they're eligible for J-51? Sure. What is your HPD's outreach strategy? Sure. Um, as I mentioned before, owners generally submit a J-51 application after they complete their work. 
Um, all of the information in the full process and application forms can be found on HPD's website and also by calling 212-863-5517. Um, J51 is a program that has been in existence for quite a long time, but our website is there with full information and we're always happy to talk to people further who are interested in the program. Um, so you don't do any direct mail or any of that to building owners to let them know? At this time, we do not. And, and, and let me ask you this. When you find out perhaps a building is in a major disrepair or there's a certain amount of complaints, like I'm assuming lodged against certain um, residential buildings, would you then offer them this incentive or... How does that work? No, that's that's a good question. I, I want to emphasize that J51 is just one of many tools in HPD's toolbox for ensuring housing quality throughout the city and ensuring the viability of quality affordable housing. We have a number of different programs that we can engage with um, property owners with, and so uh, much of that information is available on our website, but we would really encourage property owners with needs to engage with us so we can take um, a holistic look and, and talk about what the right fit would be for different financing programs we offer and so forth. J51, again, is one of many tools. All right. I look forward to working with you closer on this, and thank you, uh, thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, just give some context to why um, 790 in particular, I'm sorry, 1545 is so important to me. Um, uh, in another life, uh, I was responsible for conducting with students an alcohol outlet density survey for Brooklyn and Manhattan, um, where we GIS mapped um, signs, our advertisements, alcohol advertisements, and then did a, did a commercial overlay, proximity to schools, proximity to churches, proximity to recreation centers. Um, and it was, it was pretty bad uh, at that time, and this was uh, maybe two decades ago. And um, I'm, not, I'm not at liberty to mention the companies because there were two companies that were very egregious in their advertising, and I was actually personally sued, so I can never mention their names in public. Uh, big shout out to the legal system in New York that didn't allow me to do that. But so it's, it's incredibly important um, to, to, to begin to make some steps towards remedying it. So does, does the city collect data on advertisements of alcohol beverages that are near schools? And if so, what are the findings? So we don't currently collect that data, uh, as there is no prohibition against around that content. However, we do know of uh, certain locations where signage exists. So currently, outdoor advertising companies are required to register signs with the department that are either 900 feet from an arterial highway or 200 feet from a park. So we are aware of a certain universe. Um, also, if I'm not mistaken, didn't uh, the uh, MTA have regulations put in for advertisements on the trains and in subways? Correct. The MTA banned uh, advertisement of alcohol, uh, alcoholic beverages in 2018. Uh, so that is in existence currently. All right. So this, we feel like this is obviously inconsistent with what the city has already done to some degree to um, make sure that our, our children at least are safe from targeted advertisement. And that's what kind of we called it, was it was pretty targeted based on proximity to schools, parks, recreation centers. So there's already been some work done around it. Uh, we think the bill goes a little bit further. Um, it's not a panacea, obviously, to get rid of all because we have, um, you know, as long as we have the internet and as long as we have television and radio, that's a whole nother medium. Um, but from the city's concerns, uh, we feel like this bill would, would at least be helpful in, sh in shaping the way advertisement to minors or targeting advertising, targeted advertising is dealt with. We very much agree. I mean, for the reasons you laid out, obviously the Department of Buildings is not the public health expert, but certainly there has been uh, uh, research to show the correlation between the two, and, and certainly you're right to, to point out to the MTA and the mayor's, obviously the mayor's executive order earlier this year, um, establishing the same uh, prohibition. So we are, we are fully supportive. So thank you so much for your uh, answers. Um, I believe if there are no more questions, uh, we're going to move to the, the, the general panels. Thank you so much for your time and your um, commitment to these bills. So the first panel is uh, Max Bookman. Ari Isaacs, 
And uh, I think that's Richie Nallen. So sorry. Nagan. Sorry, Mr. Nagan. Yes. Are you, are you a doctor? Because that's a doctor's handwriting. I'm just teasing. I'm teasing. I can do it right neatly if I take my time. I know. We don't allow for you to take your time around here. No taking your time in this place. Yeah. So once you've made yourselves comfortable, we are going to begin your testimony. Um, I ask that you state your name in totality for the record, and then you can begin your testimony. I'm sorry, we do have you on a, uh, we uh, changed it to a three minute call. Oh, very nice. Okay. I come up with an extra minute to what, what I want to say. Uh, it, goes, thank it goes really quickly, so. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Max Bookman. I'm an attorney. I represent the New York City Hospitality Alliance, which is a not-for-profit trade association that represents our eating and drinking establishments in New York City. And when I'm not wearing that hat, my firm represents uh, several hundred uh, on a yearly basis, um, bars and restaurants, hotels in alcohol licensing matters. We're considered uh, specialists in the field of alcohol licensing. I'm regularly giving um, uh, educational classes to uh, other lawyers and to uh, restaurants and bars in the field of alcohol licensing. So on behalf of the Alliance, which is the hat that I'm wearing today, I first want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to speak and for your advocacy for our small business community. We've worked with you on many matters in the past, and we count you as an ally. And so we thank you for your leadership for matters uh, important to our industry. And so in that spirit of friendship, uh, when we disagree, uh, we let you know. And this is a bill that I think uh, in, uh, in a broad principle everybody could agree that underage drinking is something that we stand against and the Alliance certainly does. Uh, that's why when we worked with the NYPD to come out with this uh, booklet, the Best Practices for Nightlife Establishments, which is now in its third year, we devoted an entire section to age verification to combat underage drinking. I want to make two brief points today which I hope uh, you'll consider and I hope uh, committee council will take into uh, consideration um, as you further consider this bill. Um, one is a legal point and the other is uh, more of a policy point. So the legal point is that there is some fairly established case law already which limits the city's ability to restrict what liquor licensed businesses licensed by the state liquor authority can do um, in the field of uh, alcohol regulation. Uh, the city has had laws that have been struck down in the past when it's interfered with the ABC, what the ABC law allows. And so um, I, I provide those citations in our comments, and I hope you'll take a look at them because we do have concerns that this law um, would be preempted by the, uh, by the state ABC law which relates to the second point, which I want to make, which is more of a policy point. Um, I think the, the bill sponsor, and I heard your words, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, we agree that the type of alcohol advertising that you have in mind is not something that's appropriate for children. What I don't want to sweep up is our small businesses who also have valid um, reasons to want to advertise in their neighborhoods. And so if you think of for a moment, uh, you know, an Italian restaurant that wants to do a billboard that shows people sitting around a dinner table and maybe one of the parents in the billboard is enjoying a glass of wine currently under the way we read the, the bill that could be interpreted we think to be prohibited and I don't think that's really what anyone's intent is and uh, we would certainly hope that there could be clarifying language in there so that our small businesses that do hold liquor licenses or beer and wine licenses uh, can still uh, be able to advertise to their communities and uh, with 10 seconds to go. Be before we move on, though, I think that's an interesting point, and it's those subtle nuances because uh, certainly the bill doesn't seek or or would not like to have unintended consequences where it damages a small business's ability mm -hmm. to advertise. I My intent and understanding of intent of the bill was those alcohol sponsors and the large ads that they place, I won't mention their names in this context, but that are that are displaying ads that, that are clearly designed to capture the attention of a younger demographic is what we are referring to. But we, I will gladly look closely at the bill to make sure that it doesn't have a disp disproportionate negative impact on small businesses, mom and pops, as you've mentioned. Thank you for that clarification, Mr. Chairman, and we're happy to work with you. Yeah, no, no, no. It's, it's those subtle nuances that we need to, to, to make sure that we're, we're aware of. And that's right? why we're here. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Hey, hello. Uh, my name is Richard Nagan. I'm a licensed Department of Buildings filing representative. 
Um, I'm here to hip you to an egregious thing happening at the building department. Did, did you just say hip me to? I'm going to hip you to it, right. yes. You know what I mean. <laughs> anyway, no, I, just, I just enjoy that. Go ahead. I'm sorry. The, the, the I, DLB, I'll give you another 30 seconds for just hip me to something. Thank you. The DOB has instituted this new system of filing where the intent is to pretty much stop people from meeting face to face where everything is done online and instead of improving what they already had to do this they started a whole new system which is stupid their public portal if you go to print an application the printing overlaps their answer is well log in and you can print a pdf i said what about the general public oh they can register for an account and when you go to file something it's costing the People, it's costing the developers and the contractors and everybody an you know, exorbitant amount of money. For instance, if you want to build a one story warehouse, the old way you file the new building application that will cover the construction, structural, plumbing, mechanical, curb cut, and the construction fence, and then a separate application for the paving. Now everything is six separate applications the new building, the old system and the other work types as separate applications with separate filing fees with record management fees which was supposed to be to cover the cost of scanning stuff even though everything's uploaded the system doesn't work there are they know it doesn't work their answer is well fill out this form and we'll get back to you in two days like when an owner logs in they have to be registered. They log in. It comes up with their main company name. But every building is owned by a separate entity. But there's no way to change the entity name. And their answer is, well, the owner can change his company name. And, his, and they just it's just like not working. And instead of trying to fix it, they just keep adding more stuff. And from what I gather, the building department people hate it. The filing reps hate it. Everybody hates it, but for some reason they keep forging ahead and it's just not working and you gotta do something to, to stop them. So that, that particular insight is important to me? Um, yes. The, the, the new commissioner has committed to making e corrections in areas of efficiency and effectiveness, right? Well, so we well, all have a, the, I think we all have the same goal. I'd like no. to hear from you uh, I'd, in I'd, testimony I'd, about how we could possibly. I'd, I'd, be, I'd love to meet with you. Okay. I, I, in fact, I, I've emailed the building department complaining and the new commissioner included, mm -hmm. and I got a warning letter that I was being unprofessional. Because I was complaining. Well, I don't. I don't know if you used hip in it or. No, uh, so I don't. I, I was very polite. <laughs> so listen, I, I certainly would yeah, like so to hear what, some what good no said, nonsense. I'll, I'll get in touch with your legislative director. He's, and right, we'll, he's right there. Yeah, we'll, we'll set up a meeting. Okay. Great. All right. Okay. Great. Thank you, Mr. Nagy. Thank you. You don't, you don't have to leave yet. No, no, I'm cool. All right, All right. The, uh, but we can move on to yeah. the next testimony. Hi, good morning. My name is Ari Isaacs. I, too, am a Class II uh, Code and Zoning representative in New York. I work for Howard, Howard Zimmerman Architects as, as their Code uh, and Zoning Manager. I also am here to uh, just state in front of the Council some of the concerns that I and a number of expediters have in New York about the new DOB Now system. That's the official name, DOB Now. The, the fact that filing representatives such as myself are not officially able to file jobs with the City of New York as per, uh, as per this new system, only the architect or engineer of record is allowed to formally do that. That's a change in procedure that makes things more difficult for all parties involved. In addition, as sort of a general request, uh, my hope is that the, uh, the uh, DOB will enlist the assistance of filing representatives like myself, those of us who do this every day for a living. Uh, since we are the ones who are working with the system, it would make sense to me that we, sh we should ask some input and some involvement in its construction, in its operation, and my hope is that the city will give some consideration to allowing that to happen. Thank you. So we've had a conversation um, with uh, the former commissioner and now the current commissioner, and uh, with all due respect to her, and in her absence, I don't remember the exact answer that she gave to me for why the change was made. Um, but if you would reach out to my office, we can continue this dialogue. So you should know that um, whatever level of success we've had as an office has been based on having these conversations 
often. Um, so I'd like to hear from you formally. I, I, it works better for me if you submit to me recommendations. Sure. Um, I, because I'm, I'm, I'm duly bound to turn um, your concerns into recommendations, into policy and legislation. So if you could help me skip one of those steps by just giving me the recommendations, I would greatly appreciate it. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. We're going to move to the next panel, which is uh, Ellen Davidson and Tom Waters. Yeah, yeah. So we'll be in touch. Mr. Nagin. You too. Thank you. Awesome. So again, I just ask that you um, submit your names in totality for the record, and then you can begin your testimony whenever you'd like. Sorry, Ellen Davidson, staff attorney, the Legal Aid Society. Uh, Tom Waters, housing policy analyst, the Community Service Society of New York. Uh, thank you for this uh, opportunity to testify on J51. Uh, did the same thing uh, seven or eight years ago. Um, the last time uh, it was renewed. Um, and um, much of what I want to say is the same um, as then. J51 is uh, an extraordinarily expensive uh, program, and its um, costs have run away from its benefits. Uh, because many provisions of it don't um, uh, don't fit the present day reality of housing in New York City, um, the the program from its beginning in the 50s was changed many times over the years to sort of broaden its uh, sweep and make more and more um, improvements to buildings eligible uh, for the benefits of J51. Um, that stopped in the 90s, but the program continued to grow tremendously uh, as um, real estate activity in the city increased. And um, I believe the um, J51 benefits were given to more and more improvements um, that would have been made without the incentive um, undermining the efficiency of the program. Um, you can get the flavor of that by, by looking at uh, figure one in, my, uh, in our uh, testimony that that shows what's happened over the last 18 years, it's on page three, um, which is that uh, of the four components of the program that are uh, analyzed separately by the Department of Finance in their uh, report on tax expenditures, um, two of them are, are, shrink, are going down and two of them are exploding upwards. It's the abatements, um, the abatement component of the program that is shrinking and the exemption component that is increasing, and that's happening regardless of whether you're talking about rental apartments or condos and co-ops. Um, I think the reason for that, that, it certainly isn't because anyone decided that they thought there should be more exemptions and fewer abatements, um, nor is it because anyone anticipated the kinds of changes that happened and thought that a shift from abatements to exemptions would be a good response to that and designed it into the program. This was not intentionally designed into the program, I'm uh, certain. Um, instead, it's just because uh, of an uh, unintended consequence of um, provisions that were intended to target the program. So exemptions are not available if, uh-oh, uh, you can't get exemptions in Manhattan below Harlem. Well, uh, more and more of the high-end development of the city is outside Manhattan below Harlem, and that's why exemptions are exploding. Uh, should I keep going? Um, abatements are limited by the value of the property, and the number has not been updated over the years. So. It's a, the, the, the limit um, for property value that the abatement applies to um, is getting lower and lower relative to values in the city, and therefore it's getting more restrictive. Um, so those, those that nobody, th these things are supposed to be targeting the uh, 
uh, incentive to buildings with low income tenants who really need the incentive to get decent conditions. But it's not working anymore because the city has changed since the last time these provisions were updated. And it has an unintended result of shifting from abatements to exemptions, an unintended result of letting this program grow faster than it needs to. Um, and in fact, abatements are the better targeted part of the program and exemptions are the less well targeted part. So it's getting less well targeted in addition to those problems. And I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, and uh, from the Legal Aid Society, uh, one of the things that we wanted to talk about was the lack of enforcement that has gone on with the J-51 building. Um, I listened to the deputy commissioner's testimony about their great enforcement unit. Um, we represent a building in Queens, uh, which uh, received J-51 benefit uh, starting 10 years ago. Um, and the landlord did indeed say, I'm going to register the units. He registered 10 units in his built in his 110 unit building as rent regulated. Um, and those 10 tenants got access to screen dream benefits. Um, but the clients that we represented had no access to any uh, benefits because they were told they were not regulated because uh, HPD was unable to simply go from uh, seeing that 10 units were registered to seeing that their own system said that this was a 110 unit building. So it's been our experience that there's no enforcement of the regulation. Um, in my testimony, I talk about how the city talks talked in our lawsuit about how unimportant the rent regulation part of the statute was and how they didn't see any reason to enforce it. Um, in addition, the point of J51 is to lessen um, the increase that tenants get for major capital improvements because a landlord can get both a J51 benefit and a major capital improvement benefit. And the way it is supposed to work is the tenants get a 50% um, uh, of the major capital improvement that is approved by HCR. But as you could see from HPD's testimony, there's not a lot of conversations going on between the city and the state. They both have their own so there's no mechanism to ensure that a building that gets a j51 that hcr knows that the building is getting a j51 and therefore the tenant gets the benefit of the reduction in the mci increase um, and so from our perspective to the extent that this 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 program is uh renewed it should have additional um enforcement mechanisms in it to make sure that the very important tenant protections that the agency talked about are actually uh, uh, protections tenants receive. So those those um, amendments and or adjustments uh, to what we spoke about today or the bill, you know, the extension itself, have you documented that somewhere? Outside of your testimony, because obviously I'm going to go back over your testimony in particular, but... Um, Sadly, um, I think we... We did not know that J51 was coming up for renewal. We we are happy to work. Um, uh, we're happy to work on if we had more time recommendations that could be part of uh, changes to the law. Um, we we found out that this was on the agenda about a week and a half ago, and it just didn't give us enough time to produce uh, uh, anything. But I I think we'd love to work with you um, and to come up with ways of, of making this program better. So I'm not the bill sponsor, but as the chair of the committee, I'd be interested to hear uh, those recommendations. So to the extent that you could put it together, you know, relatively quickly, this is this is a hearing and this is actually what hearings are designed to do. Mm -hmm. So I, if you could get that to me sooner than later, I'd greatly appreciate even even a rudimentary document to, to, to have us look at it to make sure that we're making you know, that the intended purpose of the extension meets the needs and the goals, right? That's, yeah. that's yeah. the goal here. So. Yeah, we can do that. Uh, also, I did do a report in 2012 on uh, J51, which is on the CSS website, and I can, I can send, uh, send you a copy as well. If you, if you do that, I'd greatly appreciate it. you had it. recommendations in it. Yes. I would, I would appreciate that. Yeah. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. I'd appreciate it as well if you get something that you can share with, with me as well. Thank you. Great. So whatever, whatever um, I'll commit to you that whatever they are able to, to turn around for us, we will definitely share with the committee. Um, and we have uh, some of the most capable uh, counsel 
uh, in this committee. So I'd really appreciate if you could get that to me sooner than later. Great. Thank you. And I'll talk to the bill sponsor as Thank well. You. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. So in a record landmark hearing, um, we are about to close. You have any comments, Council Member? Uh, I, and I, I'm glad we had this opportunity to go through this. It's, I think, very timely for as far as I'm concerned, and we look forward to moving forward with it and making something happen. Housing and Buildings is adjourned.